Good morning, everybody. Um, during my youth and my school holidays, my mother used to pack me off to my grandparents. And the one thing I really liked about that environment was their amazing garden. It was huge. And every day, they'd be sort of walking around it and picking up walnuts off the ground or digging potatoes, uh, cutting asparagus, etc. And my grandmother always seemed to be trying to figure out ways to save that produce. Around 40 years later, I was reading a book by Michael Pollan called The Omnivore's Dilemma. And the memory of that environment came flooding back. And something deep inside of me changed. I remember thinking, if I was going to have healthy, sustainable, nutritious food, like my grandparents had, it was up to me to produce it. Pollan's book made me realise that industrial agriculture was not there to give that to me. Their job was to create a profit, and that was all. Now, they like running the story that only they are capable of you know, feeding the 9.5 billion people that'll be here by 2050, or the 11 billion by the end of the century. And we've just got to let them get on and do that, because if we don't, we're going to have a lot of hungry people. Excuse me for swearing, but I say bullshit to that. I say bullshit to that because we already have enough food today to feed every single man, woman and child on this planet at least 3,000 calories, and that's more than anybody needs. Hunger is not created by our food production or lack thereof. It's created by war, bad logistics getting food to those people, or getting those people out of poverty so they can afford to pay for the food should it ever arrive. So if we do produce enough food already for the people we have today or the people that will be here by the end of the century, what should change? As far as I'm concerned, what has to change is the food production system itself. And I don't really have an issue with industrial agriculture as an industry. I mean, they're just working with the cars they've been dealt. And just like any other industry, they can lobby to have those cars changed if they'd like them changed. What I fundamentally have an issue with is that we don't have governance around that system. So consequently, I believe that we need a national food policy. Now, a national food policy, policy should be a cross-government department system that in, integrates, uh, let's say, in environment, climate, water, health, education, trade and development, along with agriculture. So they can take a full view, a triple bottom line view, of how this food production system impacts upon our environment, our society, and our economics. See, industrial agriculture has been focusing on increasing productions for the last 50 years, and at the same time, nutritional values have been dropping. Consequently, we're in a situation now where we have over 2 billion people on the planet who are either overweight or obese. Yet the majority of the people on this planet can't even get the minimum daily recommended intake of nutrients. Calorie-dense, nutrient-poor food is now our norm. That's expensive for us. In Australia, we paid out over $58 billion last year to manage the ailments associated with being overweight or obese. In America, they invested $140 billion purely to manage type 2 diabetes. That's $50 billion more than they spent on tobacco-related ailments. This process is expensive. Over the last 50 years of the so-called Green Revolution, industrial agriculture has ripped so much organic matter out of the soil and it's volatilised off into the atmosphere that they are responsible for 40% of the excess CO2 on our atmosphere today. An estimate put forward by the uh, UN Trade and Development Conference in 2013 was that if industrial agriculture was made responsible for all their externalities, they would be responsible for 50% of the annual greenhouse gas emissions. Yet, are they ever brought up in climate change talks? Maybe for, you know, the, the between 11 and 15% that agriculture is actually blamed for, and most farmers will say, oh, well, you know, we just have to figure out how to stop cows farting. No, this is serious stuff, and it's costing us a lot of money. So once again, I believe we need a national food policy. We need to figure out the total cost of the system and how to unpack it, but still so we can have enough produce to feed everybody, but in a healthy, sustainable way. 
Before the last election, we were heading in that direction. We had a, a white and green paper developed called the National Food Plan. Unfortunately, since the last election, that has devolved to being an agricultural competitiveness document. And we have our health department um, surveying us to see whether we'd like to have overweight and obese people paid, paying more for health insurance. I do not regard that as being a mature approach to creating good policy development. So, if BAU and the governance around BAU is inappropriate, what's the alternative? Well, in fact, it's up to you and I. I would like you to help me build some soil. I know that sounds a bit strange for some people, but yes, you can build soil. You can grow soil. So anybody that has one cubic metre available on their property, I would like you to build a compost. And that's the minimum size you need to make a good hot compost. Now, I'm not talking about one of these composts that you, you know, cruise around the back of the garage and you throw your kitchen waste onto and you poke it after a couple of months to see whether it's alive because it smells so bad. No, I mean one of these composts that is layered with brown and green material, carbon and nitrogen layered like a lasagna that you sprinkle some lawn clippings on to get some heat happening, maybe some crushed bamboo to spice it up a bit, well, to give it some silica, actually. Then you put some complex carbohydrates on, like, uh, let's say, blackstrap molasses to fire up all the bacteria, and some fish hydrolysate or some kelp to fire up all the fungus. The fungus will get in and eat all the carbon. The bacteria will eat all the nitrogen and green material. Then you turn into a bit of an alchemist, it's sort of like Goldilocks principle. It can't be too hot, can't be too cold, not too wet, not too dry. Give it a spray every now and again, give it a turn when appropriate. And after about two to three months, you should be able to take a handful of the stuff and rub it between your palms. Take off the excess. And if you have black lines in your palm prints, you know it's gone from being a compost to being soil. That's humus. Now that's the structure. We don't fully understand yet, but it's a structure that is only made by microorganisms consuming organic matter. Smell it, and that heady, earthy, gorgeous smell will hit you. And I can guarantee it'll make you smile. In fact, I can guarantee it so much. It's being researched, the microbacterium that creates that smell, is being researched as an antidepressant because of the amazing increase in serotonin levels that kicks off in the brain. Once you actually make the soil for the first time, hopefully you'll start to understand that what we grow our food in isn't dirt. It's this profound universe of trillions of organisms that are actually in there munching down on um, all this organic matter. You've got uh, fungal acids going out and dissolving rock, and taking all the sulfur and things out. All these mineralization processes are happening all these organisms fighting and eating each other up and spitting out the nutrients that they can't process, and most of them, this is happening right next to the root of the plant. And in exchange, the plant gives off them some carbon. It's a symbiotic relationship that's been going on for almost half a billion years, and it stops the moment you put a chemical fertilizer on the soil. So with this understanding, I would like you to go along to the supermarket and then start looking at the foods around you. And you'll think about that apple. Why has it been sprayed? Oh, it's been sprayed for transport purposes. The normal Australian, what's called the Australian uh, food basket, which has 27 items in it, has travelled an equivalent of 20,000 kilometres or more to get to you. That's a lot of energy being put into purely transport. Try and buy a local. Pick up that nice, green, crispy, hydroponically grown lettuce and ask yourself at least two questions. Since it was grown without soil, can it in fact have a full nutrient, nutrient profile? And since it was grown with chemicals, how has the farmer cared for those chemicals and disposed of them after the growing process? Do your due diligence. Unfortunately, no matter what supermarkets tell you, they are not the farmer's friend, which is a real shame because we have some amazing farmers in Australia. We have some of the best farmers in the world in Australia, and we should support them. But supermarkets, their first and foremost friend, according to corporate law, is their shareholders. So we've got to go out and find these farms and support them. Research them on the internet. Do they have an online store that you can buy from? Uh, do they distribute at um, farmers markets? If they do, great. Go along and support them at those farmers markets. Do your same due diligence there too. We've got a great farmers market here in Orange. Um, 
And we were here, my wife and I, a few weeks ago, and I noticed one of the vegetable retailers selling coconuts. And I sort of thought, okay, so they've either gone down to Sydney and bought them down there and bought them back and trying to sell them to me, or you guys have had way more climate change than you, you're aware of. <laughs> Obviously, it wasn't local produce. You, don't be scared to actually say to these people, hold on a moment, this isn't local. You actually sign a contract with the people that run the these farmers market that you will only sell local produce. It's your money, it's your food, it's your health. Ask the questions. Obviously the best way to get the food that you want and for it to be nutritionally rich is to grow it yourself. And always uh, there's some kind of excuse, you know, oh, I don't have the space or I don't have the time. Space, grab yourself two or three plastic containers about yay big and about 400 mil deep. Put a plumbing pipe in the middle, surround it with soil, pour some water down the pipe and watch the water sort of wick up through that soil. It's a wicking bed design and it's one of the most efficient ways of growing things. You use about one tenth the amount of water because the water comes up but doesn't actually get to the top and therefore evaporate. And because the roots are always slightly damp, they grow between a quarter and a half as quickly, sorry, 25 to 50% quicker than things that would be grown outside. If space isn't your issue, then consider the fact that for every square metre of soil that you can turn into garden, you can grow at least 30 kilos of food. That's equivalent to close to uh, $200 worth of tomatoes. That's enough tomatoes for one person for a whole year. That's quite a lot from just one square metre of soil. If you can push that out to 10 square metres, please do so, because you're going to be heading towards a third of a tonne of amazingly nutritious food that you don't have to pay somebody else for. Now you know how to build a compost, you can actually build some good soil to grow some good plants. It's not hard to do, you've just got to build that first compost. If you consider that a normal couple can get by on 10, uh, sorry, 40 square metres, for two-thirds of their annual food supply, that's not a lot. Eight by five metres, mm, that'll fit into most uh, one of these you know, backyard lawns. Dig up the lawn, surround it with some fruit trees. Get them there, you come home from work and you're cranky, get them there, smell that microbacterium, you'll be inside smiling. <laughs> okay, it's a great way to get happy. Building soil makes you happy. If you think time's your issue, Consider the fact that for the investment that you make now, it will pay for itself at least a hundredfold in general well-being, financial savings, and smiles. Educate yourself. Learn how to build that compost. Learn how to build that soil. Learn how to grow things in that soil. Push it out maybe, do a permaculture design course or a holistic management course. Just learn whatever you can to make yourself responsible for the food that you eat. Your wallet, your stomach, and your health will love you for it. We've got to be stronger in the, what we do with our money. We own the environment. We own the consumer environment. Industrial agriculture is only responsible for 30% of the food that is grown in the world. Subsistence farmers and small farmers are responsible for the rest. Yet industrial agriculture dictates so much of our policy. Our farmers are not being paid enough for their food. That one dollar litre of milk that you go to the supermarket, the farmer can hardly afford to feed his family, let alone his soil. Please try and think through that your mind and your wallet are the most powerful thing on the planet to make sure that we get nutritious, rich food. I would like to, as it's the uh, International Year of the Soil, I would like to leave you with a message sent to me recently by the Soil Advocate for Australia, uh, Major General Michael Jeffrey. The survival of the planet depends upon how we manage the top 15 centimetres of our soil, which we are rapidly degrading in both quality and quantity. Leading practice farmers, however, are demonstrating how to successfully manage both. 
resulting in maximising nutritional outcomes for both food and fibre, and thus to healthier people. It is the nutritional value of food we eat that must be measured and then displayed in our food chain outlets, including from where it is grown. And it is the consumer, therefore, who must help drive the essential change in landscape management. Thank you.